It is therefore time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Human X levels have been approaching the 40s this week. This hits home for me. My mother and my aunt have been lifelong educators in the City of Toronto. Our schools don't have the infrastructure or air conditioning. Students are saying it's so hot in classrooms they are having trouble breathing. This is unacceptable in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, rather than heckling, will the Premier commit here today that we'll have a mandate for maximum temperatures for Ontario schools in the event of extreme heat? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know that the Minister of Education is going to want to comment on the specifics. And I know that when a classroom is hot, it is uncomfortable for teachers and for students, Mr. Speaker. I recognize that, and it has been very, very hot, Mr. Speaker. Um, we understand that uh, there have been concerns raised by students and parents and teachers. And, Mr. Speaker, you know we have we have worked to provide additional funds to uh, schools because we recognize that. The majority of schools in this province were built years ago, Mr. Speaker, when we actually didn't have, on a regular basis, the uh, the kinds of peak hot periods that uh, that we have. We certainly didn't have them in September, Mr. Speaker, and so that's why there has been more money, 1.4 billion dollars, actually, Mr. Speaker, put into school boards so that they could Answer. make retrofits and they could provide uh, supports to schools that were built uh, in another day, Mr. Speaker. So that's exactly why we put those funds in place. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. It's another sweltering day, sweltering day in September. Yesterday, temperatures hit as high as 31, and with the humidex, it made it feel in the 40s. Heat warnings have swept the area, yet classrooms don't have air conditioning. We have classrooms that don't have windows that can even open. You know, Sam Hammond from the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario had this to say, and I will quote him. Students and teachers in many classrooms are subject to unbearable conditions with temperatures over 30 degrees. That takes an unacceptable toll on teaching and learning. Mr. Speaker, how has the Premier allowed this to happen? They've been in government for 14 years, and here we are with schools without air conditioning, with windows that can't open. I don't want political spin. Will it be dealt with? Are kids going to continue to have to learn in temperatures that are unbearable? Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, I am I am as concerned as the uh, leader of the opposition about the well-being of students, Mr. Speaker, in our school, the well-being of teachers, and I know, uh, you know, the uh, one of the schools where the uh, leader of the opposition's mother uh, was the principal was in my riding, Mr. Speaker. It is a school that has had a huge new addition that has built on been built onto it, Mr. Speaker, in the time that uh, we've been in government. Um, that St. Bonaventure School in uh, Don Valley West, Mr. Speaker. We have put billions of dollars into the hands of school boards. They have the knowledge of their schools. They have the. They need to have the flexibility to uh, to make the changes that are necessary, Mr. Speaker. I understand that it is very hot right now, but I do believe that at the local level, schools need to uh, have the. Uh, they need to have the flexibility to make decisions. And, Mr. Speaker, I have utmost faith in teachers, in Answer. principals. If there's a situation that is uh, that is dangerous for kids, they're going to move those kids into. The the gym, they're going to put fans in place, they're going to do what's necessary to make sure that Thank those you. kids. I have a great faith in our educators, Mr. Speaker. Final Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. The Premier quotes these great renovations and the Liberal caucus claps. Here are the stats. There are 584 schools in the Toronto District School Board. Only 125 of those schools have air conditioning. 584 schools, 125 with air conditioning. Others have partial air conditioning or none at all. Order. Krista Wiley from the parent group Fix Our Schools said this, I, I will quote, if the Premier, who I bet is sitting in an air-conditioned office right now, prioritizes our children as the future, then her government will prioritize our kids and start to look at our schools as the important infrastructure they really are. In the meantime, how can the Premier expect students to learn while they're sitting, trying to learn in unbearable classrooms? Mr. Speaker, Question. again. Rather than attacking others, rather than saying everything is fine, I ask the Premier, will she mandate maximum temperatures for Ontario schools in the event of extreme heat, yes or Thank no? You. Mr. Speaker, um, you know, I had to uh, 
I had to move uh, a meeting yesterday from my office to another room because actually I don't have air conditioning in all the rooms. <laughs> Do I have air conditioning in my house? Mr. Speaker. Order. Order. Member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke, come to order. Ma Minister of Agriculture, come to order. <laughs> Finish, please. Mr. Speaker, I recognize that it is very hot in schools that were built in a time when, uh, when there weren't the kinds of uh, heat events that we have. There wasn't the peak heat that we have now, Mr. Speaker. Uh, that is exactly why we have put billions of dollars in the hands of school boards, Mr. Speaker, to make changes, to make sure that they do the retrofits, which are happening, Mr. Speaker, across the province. And, and I'm not in any way saying that that work is completely done, Mr. Speaker, but again, I have a lot of faith in the educators in our schools, Mr. Speaker, to make sure Answer. that children and teachers are kept safe. Thank you. New question, the leader of the opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Northern Ontario is an absolute gem. And while I'm disappointed that the Liberal member from Northumberland, Quinty West, has neglected to apologize for his hurtful comments referring to Northern Ontario as no man's land, it's time we turn this negative story into a positive. As you know, Mr. Speaker, I've been to Northern Ontario 27 times since being elected leader of the You're Ontario here. PCs, here. and the North has so much to offer. From beautiful landscapes to a dynamic population, the North truly has limitless potential in fields ranging from tourism to resource development. I always see the greatness of Northern Ontario, and I understand just how important it is for Ontario for the North to prosper. Because when the North prospers, Ontario prospers. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier and the member from North Ontario and Quinty West give me the pleasure of joining me on one of my Northern tours this fall? And this is um, precisely why we have a problem. I would remind us all, let's raise ourselves. Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, um, I think that uh, it's I think we all recognize that the member for Northumberland Quinty West is one of the best respected members in this house. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, particularly, particularly to represent, even when he wasn't a member, in the That's interim right. period when he That's wasn't right. a member, Mr. Right. Speaker, right. he was traveling this province, gathering information from rural and northern communities, Mr. Yeah. Speaker, right. to inform the policies yeah. that uh, we have put in place. And then, Mr. Speaker, unlike the, the members opposite, he actually voted to increase the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund oh. to an unprecedented $100 million a year. He voted to invest a billion dollars in the Ring of Fire. He voted to increase the Northern Highways program yes, by $90 million, bringing it to $648 million annually, Mr. Speaker. He voted to give Ontarians in rural and northern communities up to 50 per cent off you. their electricity bills, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. <laughs> Supplementary. The member from Sault Ste. Marie. To the Premier. My home of Sault Ste. Marie has Stop the clock.
the Minister of Indigenous Affairs, of Relations and Reconciliation will come to order. Another plea. Let's ensure that we elevate ourselves instead of spiral down. Please. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My home of Sault Ste. Marie has overcome its fair share of challenges. We are a city filled with breathtaking tourist attractions that embody our natural beauty, made famous by the Group of Seven. We are a city that produced incredible people that have had a significant impact on our Canadian culture and our identity. People such as Roberta Bondar, the first woman ever to fly in space, Canada's Governor General David Johnston, NHL Hall of Famers Ron Francis and Tony and Phil Esposito, gold medalist Brad Jacobs, Ryan and EJ Arndon, Paralympic gold medalist Mac Marcoux, even Sir, Will, uh, Sir William Howard Hurst, the seventh Premier of Ontario, began his career in, in Sault Ste. Marie. In fact, Wayne Gretzky's number 99 was born in Sault Ste. Marie. Question. I could go on. So, Premier, please, would you permit the member from Northumberland, Quinty West, to join me and celebrate our natural beauty, our rich history in Sault Ste. Marie, and see what a great contribution we provide to Ontario? You see it, please. Premier. Mr. Affairs. Speaker, thank you. Uh, Thank you for the question. I guess some congratulations are in order. First, perhaps to the leader of the official opposition, who actually almost made it through that question without smiling. He just about got there. I don't think he quite made it. Yep. Also, congratulations to the member from North Bay, who I think are doing their best to create a headline, try and grab a headline. I understand you've actually been successful in getting a headline or two on this issue. So absolutely, congratulations Chair, to you for this ridiculous narrative. Anybody who's been paying attention to what's going on here since 2003 understands very completely the distinction and the difference that has come from this party since we've been in government relative to what happened between 1995 and 2003. Nobody else is buying your nonsense. That's all I have to say. And perhaps if I could, a little bit of advice for the member of Sault Ste. Marie. Just because they ask you to ask questions like this, you don't have to do it. You don't have to. You don't have to. You don't have to. It's, it, it's not. It's not. Final supplementary. The member from Nipissing. Thank you. Uh, evening, uh, Speaker. Back to the Premier. The North is home to a vibrant aerospace and tech industry, health and education sector, and a marriage of tourism and resource development. I'm personally inviting the Minister member from North Un Social Northumberland, Quinty West, to visit us. Join me as we paddle the historic Lavaz River together. We'll start in Trout Lake and paddle by folks, Speaker, who are catching their dinner. Then we're going to we're going to have to portage a fair bit, Lou. We'll then pass Fabrine Industries, one of the region's largest manufacturers and global exporters. We'll pull in at Billy Bob's Bait for one of the best. Look, I uh, I've been calmly trying to seek everyone's cooperation with this line. If this continues, I'm going to take a break and ask that cooler heads prevail. And I have to tell you, this is disappointing that I have to ask this. Carry on, please. As I said, we'll pull in at Billy Bob's for one of the best burgers you'll ever have. We'll end up at Lake Nipissing, in the same spot discovered by the First Nations thousand years ago and shared with Samuel de Champlain 400 years ago. I asked the Premier Speaker, will she encourage her members to 
end their arrogance, to come to Nipissing and change their view of the North. Minister. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And it's great to have two Northern Ontario ministers talking about how great Northern Ontario is, Mr. Speaker. And also, I would like to, Mr. Speaker, to take you on a stroll through fantastic Northern Ontario. And as the opposition party members should know, we have 100,000 more people with expanded broadband throughout the north, a $32 million investment made by this government, Mr. Speaker. And as you continue to stroll between North Bay and Sturgeon Falls, you'll see road construction, Mr. Speaker, with a build-on sign that shows that this government is continuing to invest in Northern Ontario. And as you work your way to, you know, Sault Ste. Marie and see the nearly $6 billion, the $6 billion that we've been invested in since 2003 in the Northern High Highways program, health care, seven new hospitals, Mr. Speaker, and I was just in Sault Ste. Marie, Mr. Speaker, making an announcement about more funding coming to the Sioux, Mr. Speaker, from That's this right. government. We have, Mr. Speaker, continued to invest in beautiful Northern Ontario. We will continue to do so every single time they vote against it, Mr. Speaker. New question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Yesterday, the Minister of Energy defended the $5.5 million hydro campaign, uh, ad campaign by saying, quote, it's important for the government to inform the public of government programs and help them to budget. How much money did the Liberal government spend in the last decade or so, people, our Speaker, to help people budget for the 300 per cent increase in hydro rates? Well, Mr. Speaker, um, let me just say that uh, it is important for people in this province to know about the programs that are in place. And on, uh, on electricity pricing, Mr. Speaker, for example, the OESP program that is in place to support low-income Ontarians, on top of the 25 per cent reduction that they have seen over the summer, Mr. Speaker, it's important that people know about those programs. I have met, uh, I've met uh, people who are no longer students, Mr. Speaker, but who want to go back to school, and they didn't know, Mr. Speaker, that they were eligible for free tuition. So whether it's uh, whether it's advertising about uh, the Fair Hydro Plan or whether it's advertising about the changes to OSAP, Mr. Speaker, it is important that everyone in Ontario knows what is available to them so that they can access programs that will help them in their lives, Mr. Speaker. That's Sir. what the advertising is about. Whether it's about tuition or whether it's about lower electricity prices. Thank you. Speaker, these ads are a desperate attempt by the Liberal government uh, to put out ads that are very similar to campaign ads, and they are trying to convince the people of Ontario uh, that they are doing something to reduce their bills when we know that that's not the case. They do not inform Ontarians of any action or program that they can actually sign up for as a result of this uh, particular ad speaker. In fact, the advertisements about the low-income support program that the Premier references are a separate package of ad speaker, and they sure as heck weren't funded at the $5.5 million price tag that the more partisan ads that the Liberals have put forward are. So why is this Premier putting the interests of herself and her Liberal Party once again Again, ahead of Ontario families who are struggling just to keep the lights on and put food on the table. Well, Mr. Speaker, I know that the uh, Minister of Energy will want to uh, comment on the specifics of the ads, except to say, Mr. Speaker, let me just be clear that those ads point people to a website, Mr. Speaker. They all point people to a website that gives the information, and I know that the leader of the third party, is, uh, is uh, she understands that you can't put all the information in one ad, but, Mr. Speaker, every one of those ads either gives 
uh, some explicit information or points people to uh, a website where they can get the information that they need, whether it's about uh, a support program on lower electricity prices or whether it's about how to access free tuition, Mr. Speaker, or uh, in the case of the OHIP Plus, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that people know that starting in January that uh, children from zero through to their 25th birthday will have access to free prescription medication. Uh, people need to have that information because if they don't yes, know sir. that, Mr. Speaker, then they won't know that all they need is their health card to go into a, a pharmacy and get their uh, prescription filled, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Final supplementary. Speaker, internal government documents confirm that the reason the Premier wanted this ad campaign was to, quote, combat negative media coverage of rising electricity bills. That was the purpose of these ads. That was the reason for this particular ad by Speaker. So, can the Premier tell us how combating negative media coverage for the Liberal Party will help Ontario families pay their soaring hydro bills? Thank you. Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I have been very clear that we recognize that electricity prices were going up too fast and too far. We had made billions of dollars of investment in the electricity system, Mr. Speaker, and we recognize that what we were already doing, we had made changes, we had renegotiated uh, the Samsung uh, agreement, Mr. Speaker, taken billions of dollars out of the system, but still there was more that needed to be done. And so, Mr. Speaker, we made changes, we put new programs in place like the OESP, Mr. Speaker, we took 25 percent reduction off people's bills, we put programs in place for businesses, Mr. Speaker, changed the parameters around the ICI program, which was uh, originally for larger businesses and was then uh, redesigned to, uh, to accommodate smaller businesses. So, Mr. Speaker, those, those pieces of information are available on the Member website. The the ads drive people to the website so that they can get that information. Answer. People need to know what their government's doing, Mr. Speaker. They need to know how they can benefit. That's what Thank the advertising you. is about. No question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier. Yesterday, the President of Treasury Board had a different explanation for why the Liberal government thought it was necessary to spend $5.5 million on these partisan ads. She said it, we, it was because people find their hydro bills quite confusing. Maybe the minister should spend more time actually speaking to Ontarians because no one that I've talked to is having any trouble understanding their bill. People are worried because their bills are too high, Speaker. That's the problem people have with their electricity bills. When will this Premier stop spending money on partisan ads and actually do something to help minister people struggling to keep up with their sky-high hydro bills? Thank you. So, Mr. Speaker, uh, I don't know if this will come as a surprise to the leader of the third party, but there are a number of things that government has to do at the same time. Yeah. So, Mr. Speaker, yes. We have reduced electricity bills by an average of 25 percent, Mr. Wow. Speaker, for all the reasons that I outlined earlier. We knew that there were concerns. We knew that people were uh, struggling with their bills. And, Mr. Speaker, we had made changes, but wasn't enough, and we have made further changes. Mr. Speaker, on top of that, I believe, and I have looked at many uh, electricity bills from around the province, as has uh, the Minister of Energy and a number of our uh, colleagues, Mr. Speaker, and they're all different. They are confusing. Some of them are less confusing than others, Mr. Speaker. And, Mr. Speaker, I think that it is responsible that we would look at a way of simplifying those bills. But that's not, that's not the only thing that we're doing. That's part Member of the change, Bruce Mr. Gray Speaker. Sound. The primary change Answer. is to lower people's electricity bills so that they could cope with those on a monthly basis, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Speaker, the people of Ontario want a government that will actually lower their electricity bills. Not, not spend millions and millions of public dollars on partisan ads talking about their $40 billion borrowing scheme that the financial accountability officer says is going to cause the electricity rates in this province to jump even higher. When will this government unveil the ad campaign to help Ontarians budget for the huge rate hikes that are coming down the road pretty quickly, as the FAO has warned about? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, 
the people of Ontario have a government that has actually lowered their yeah. electricity prices. Yeah. Mr. Speaker. just talking about in the House, Mr. Speaker, people have seen up to a 40 to 50 percent reduction because on top of the uh, electricity bill, the distribution cost was very, very high in many of those more remote communities, Mr. Speaker, and that has been reduced. That is the work that we have done. We have talked with, we have talked with consumers and experts all over this province, Mr. Speaker. We have made those reductions, and we will continue to work to find ways to support people, Remember making sure Edward that Hastings. people on low income can pay their electricity yes, bills, Mr. Speaker, that businesses can pay their electricity bills, but people across this province have seen an average of 25 percent reduction this summer, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. Speaker, the people of Ontario have a government that increased hydro rates by 300 per cent and sold off Hydro One to their friends. That's the kind of government the people of Ontario have. The Minister of Energy, Speaker, the Minister of Energy, he said he thinks that these ads are necessary because they promote a program to help people pay for their soaring bills. That's incorrect, Speaker. The Min Minister Sandals thinks these ads are necessary because the people of Ontario don't understand their hydro bills. That's incorrect, Speaker. These ads were designed with ex the express purpose of countering bad media coverage for the Liberal Party. Will the Premier admit that this ad campaign is designed to benefit her party and commit right now to stop spending money from the public purse on partisan Russia. ads that help her little Liberal Party? You say it, please. You say it, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The, le the leader of the third party has it completely wrong, Mr. Speaker. The only people that are benefiting from these ads, Mr. Speaker, are the people of Ontario learning about the 25 percent reduction that each and every one of them are getting, Mr. Speaker, along with a website. If they actually watch the ads, Mr. Speaker, rather than just complain about them, but if they watch the ads and look what's in the ads, Mr. Speaker, we are talking about the programs and we are talking about how to find out more information about how reducing your rates even more if you need more help, Mr. Speaker. And that help is included with the OESP program. And just this month, Mr. Speaker, another 5,100 people have signed up. That is important, Mr. Speaker, because now we have over 232,000 people receiving the benefits that they need. And you know what, Mr. Speaker? They're getting this, this benefit despite the opposition, despite the rhetoric that's coming, Mr. Speaker. They're actually receiving help. This government will continue to put programs in place and let the people of Ontario know that these programs are there to help them, Mr. Speaker. Your question, the member from Lampton, Kent Middlesex. Mr. Speaker, my question today is to the Premier. Small businesses are the backbones of our communities, and yet Liberals do, as they always do, attack them. Right now, the federal Liberals are pushing forward tax changes that would leave some in Ontario paying a tax rate of 73 per cent. This push is despite 94 per cent of small business owners saying the Trudeau government's tax changes will hurt Canadian businesses and their families. These tax changes could shutter stores along main streets across the province of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier help put an end to these dangerous Liberal tax hikes? Minister. Oh. I, I, I am going to let the question stand, but making sure that it, in the preamble you then direct to make sure that we're talking about policy that would assist. So I'm. Uh, I, I just remind the member for his supplemental career. Mr. of Economic Development and Growth. Mr. of Economic Development and Growth. Well, Mr. Speaker, the last time I checked, we're at Queen's Park and we're not in the Parliament buildings in Ottawa. Uh, but that's a question certainly he can ask his Conservative colleagues in Ottawa to ask. What I, how I'll respond is to say this government is working tirelessly on behalf of small business people across this province. Just yesterday, Mr. Speaker, we tabled a bill that, that entirely targets uh, cutting back on red tape for, for small businesses. Fantastic. In fact, Mr. Speaker, it's not just the bill. It comes with a package that's the most ambitious package this province has embarked on in generations, Mr. Speaker, to help reduce the cost of doing business in the province of Ontario and to open up our province 
province to working better and working and helping to make it easier for small businesses to function. Mr. Speaker, I will in all likelihood refer the supplement to, to our champion for small business, the minister responsible for small business, but I look forward to the member's supplementary. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. Jerry McCartney is Chief Executive and General Manager of the London Chamber of Commerce. He summed the Liberal message up nicely. Dear Canadian businesses, thanks, but we no longer need you. Speaker, Liberals are painting hard-working small businesses as tax cheats and have told them they are sitting in their gated communities eating cakes. It's simply not the case. These changes will hurt our neighbours, our friends, our family farms, the stores we visit every day in our communities. We must fight for Ontario small business. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier denounce these tax hikes and will she stand up for Ontario small business? Yeah. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Minister. The minister responsible for small business, Mr. Minister responsible for small business. Excellent. Well, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member for a supplementary question. Uh, I've been certainly, uh, I've been on the road. I've had the opportunity uh, to meet with chambers of commerce right across the province. I've had the opportunity to do multiple small business forums across the province. Uh, this is an opportunity uh, to hear their comments, to hear the concerns. But let me tell you, Mr. Speaker, our government has one goal in common. We're going to grow small business in the province of Ontario to make them prosper, to create the jobs that Ontarians want. New question, the member from London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Today, for the fifth straight day in a row, a heat warning was issued for Southern Ontario, which means an elevated risk of heat illness, especially for children. In schools without air conditioning, students and education workers have been sweltering in classrooms hotter than 30 degrees, close to 40 degrees with the Humidex. Students are developing heat rashes, and parents are keeping their kids home, not just to keep them comfortable, but to keep them safe. Teachers report that children are unable to concentrate, their learning compromised. Education workers struggle in the face of these unbearable conditions. Does the Premier think that 30-degree classrooms are acceptable teaching and learning environments for Ontario students and education workers? Thank you, Speaker, and I, I want to thank the member opposite for the question. Mr. Speaker, I know that when um, there is an unusually hot uh, day like yesterday and today, that it is, uh, it's uncomfortable in some classrooms. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, that's exactly why we are investing in our schools. Um, we have uh, put $1.4 billion for repairs and renewal of our schools to improve the learning environment for all students. And these, these these um, investments, Mr. Speaker, are really left up to our local school boards who have the flexibility to prioritize their needs. So they have the flexibility, Mr. Speaker, to add air conditioning. I know that there are some school boards that are making that a priority, adding areas in the school yes, that sir. can be commonly used as cooling areas like the gym or the library, record. Mr. Speaker. But these decisions are being made by our local schools Thank for you. the best interest of our students. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. The Premier knows that school facility budgets are barely enough to maintain the current state of disrepair in Ontario schools, much less fix the accumulated $15 billion backlog. This is not just an issue during heat alerts. The repair backlog increases the likelihood of broken boilers in the dead of winter, forcing children to wear winter coats in the classroom just to stay warm. Speaker, years of neglect under both the Liberals and the Conservatives have brought our schools to a tipping point. Heat waves are becoming hotter and more frequent. We need a concrete plan to address extreme classroom temperatures and create safe working and learning environments for students and education workers. Will the Premier commit today to implementing such a plan? Minister? Well, Mr. Speaker, we are 
prioritizing and implementing a plan to continue to invest in our schools. Uh, and that includes uh, building brand new schools, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we've, we've actually built 760 new schools across this province and done extensive renovations uh, and additions to over 860 schools, Mr. Speaker. And we're we are continuing to do so. And for the, the understanding that we have to continue to have upgrades and renewals to our schools is absolutely there. But, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to our local decision making and flexibility, we know that our school principals, our teachers have that understanding of the needs within their classrooms, and they are able to um, change where the, the classroom is happening. They can move students outside. I've visited schools, Mr. Speaker, where they have yes, done sir. so. And we, we want to have our local school boards making these local decisions, Mr. Thank Speaker, and, and the educators you. as well. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Your question, the member from Barry. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the minister responsible for early years and child care. Minister, I'm proud of our that our government is committing to ensuring families have access to quality and affordable. <laughs> member from the PN Carlton, come to order. Finish, please. In my riding at Barrie, I have a lot of working families who are looking for care when they need it the most, before and after work. I have heard from families that there just aren't enough uh, childcare options that fit their schedules. I know that the families of my students at Terry Fox School in Barrie are very appreciative for the great care their children receive before and after school, but more and more families need the peace of mind that this kind of care gives. I want to ensure that we are providing childcare options for these other families. Can the minister responsible for early years and childcare tell us what the government is doing to Question. make sure families' needs are properly met? Thank you, minister responsible for early years and childcare. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Barrie for this important question. I know the member has worked hard to address this issue for local families. And, Mr. Speaker, we know the workday doesn't begin and end for many families with the ring of a school bell. Here, here. Families today lead fast-paced, demanding lives, and we understand the vital role that before and after school care plays in the lives of parents and children. That is why our government committed to ensuring school boards now offer before and after school care for six to 12 year olds, a commitment we made to families in 2014. So, as of September this year, where there is sufficient demand, families can now expect before and after school programs in their local schools. Wow. I think it's fantastic. We are making it easier for families to head off to work and not worry yes, about sir. where their kids are before and after school. It's a key, key step that we're giving families the flexibility they're looking for and the support they need. Is he calling? Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that answer. It's encouraging to know that the government is working to address the needs of Ontario families. Can the Minister tell us more about how families can access these programs and where they can find them? Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to answer the member's question. In fact, just last week, I was at Our Lady of Lords Catholic School in Toronto. It is one of the many great schools in Ontario that is offering before and after school care for families. And I was able to share the progress that we've made on our commitment to families in Ontario. Speaker, I am proud to tell the House today that 83% of schools in Ontario are now offering before and after school programs wow. for four to 12 years. Just think about that. This step is making life easier for thousands of families across the province. And since the last school year, we have seen an increase of 16,000 more licensed spaces for 4 to 12 year olds. 16,000 more children now have access to the quality care they need when they need it. And parents can feel at ease heading to work knowing they have childcare yes, options. Because when our children succeed, Speaker, we all succeed. Yes, Thank you. No question. The member from Haldeman, Norfolk. To the Premier, <clears throat> for many years, farm families have been encouraged by the Ontario government to sharpen their pencils, run their operation more like a business, and, if warranted, incorporate. As farmers, we were told to think about the next generation, plan for the continuity of the farm within the family. Farmers were told to do succession planning, 
and tax planning by incorporating. Many farmers took the advice of your government but will now be punished by a punitive tax measures from your federal cousins. Premier, Chief government whip. have you challenged this tax grab on farm corporations with the Prime Minister? We ask, Question. why will you not join us in fighting these tax hikes so the coming generation of young farmers can afford to buy their Thank parents' you. farm? Here, 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 here. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. First of all, when I say thank you, your question's over. Second of all, when I stand, you sit. Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, again, this is a question that perhaps Andrew Scheer would like to be asking in, uh, in the House of Commons, Mr. Speaker. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, an effective opposition in Ottawa might actually be asking these questions and wouldn't be asked. If the uh, the opposition in Ottawa might want to be asking this question as opposed to asking in, as opposed to asking a member in a provincial legislature to ask the question, Mr. Speaker, um, I know that the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs is going to want to talk about all the things that we are doing to support farmers, Mr. Speaker. But I will just make one comment: that in the recent conversations about uh, NAFTA, Mr. Speaker, we have been extremely clear, extremely clear that in Ontario we are supportive of our agriculture sector. We will continue to support supply management. Mr. Speaker, and we will do that in the face of any uh, any incursions that the uh, that the Americans might want to make on that, Mr. Speaker. We Answer. believe in our farm sector, and we support them, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Stop, stop. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. I stand. You be quiet. <laughs> Supplementary. Member from here on Bruce. Thank you very much, Speaker. Again, back to the Premier. Last week at the International Plowing Match, the Premier praised Ontario's agri-food sector, saying, and I quote, Farming in Ontario is a critical part of our economy. It's a $37 billion industry that translates into more than 700,000 jobs, and that number is growing. It's fundamental to it's fundamental to who we are as Ontarians. Speaker. I couldn't agree more, but I have to ask, Speaker, so why then is the Premier choosing to do nothing for this sector? The Liberal Premier of Nova Scotia is standing up for farmers, so why doesn't the Premier of Ontario stand up to the federal government on behalf of Ontario farmers? This Premier has imposed a flood of new costs on farmers, and now the federal government Question. is about to attack our farmers with even more taxes. Speaker, will the Premier stand up for Ontario farmers, a group that she called critical to our economy, and demand, just like the Premier of Nova Scotia? Thank you, Premier. Uh, Minister of uh, Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Mr. Speaker, Minister. I appreciate the the question, the supplementary from the member from here on Bruce. I can say that we have been in contact with the other Lawrence Pakali, the Federal Minister of Agriculture and Agri-Food, to express our concerns, particularly when it comes to succession family for family farms in the province of Ontario. But, Mr. Speaker, I want to remind everybody, when this government brought forward an initiative to fund a $100 million risk management program, the government of Ontario were funding 40 per cent of the program. They sat and did nothing Bruce, to bring in the federal program to match it. And they're all supporting Maxine Bernier, who wanted to get rid of supply management for Ontario farmers. I did ask the member from Huron Bruce to come to order once already, and I don't want to have to say it a second time. <laughs> New question, the member from Niagara Falls. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. 
Premier, months ago I explained to you in this House that Woodbine Entertainment had implemented a stabling policy that was designed to kill the Fort Erie racetrack and the thousands of jobs that go with it. The attack on the racetrack began with the removal of the slots and 300 jobs, being excluded from the Racing Alliance. Woodbine Entertainment expanded to run B-class horses in a direct assault on Fort Erie. The flow of the off-track betting revenue to Fort Erie was stopped. Premier, you committed to keeping racetracks open in Ontario, including rural Ontario tracks like Fort Erie. It's been four months since you made that commitment. Time has run out. Will you intervene to save the Fort Erie racetrack and the thousands of jobs that depend on it? Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. We're absolutely committed to the long-term sustainability of the horse racing industry in this province. That's why our horse racing partnership plan invests $100 million a year in this very important industry. But it's also why, even though government doesn't dictate to business with regards to their business decisions, we did intervene, Mr. Speaker, on that particular matter. And when, through dis the constructive discussions with both Fort Erie, Woodbine, and Woodbine, Woodbine increased their stabling policy. Mr. Speaker, I know that the, the Minister for Agriculture and Food probably have more to say about that, but Mr. Speaker, this minister is an unbridled champion of the horse racing industry, and I know, Mr. Speaker, that he is absolutely chomping at the bit uh, to get into this on the supplementary, so I'll probably pass the supplementary to him, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, supplementary. My question is again to the Premier. You, you're right when you talk about businesses, but when you're given Woodbine, $62 million in purse money, you have a say, and when they're attacking the 40 racetrack on behalf of the members of Niagara Falls, you have an obligation to fix it. Premier, you stood there and told me that you were committed to survive a 40 racetrack and small racetrack. Our racetrack has been continuously operating for 120 years. Your inaction to stop Woodbine Entertainment's attempt to create a monopoly and throw over racing in Ontario will lead to thousands of job losses in Niagara. Over the course of the last four months, myself, numerous stakeholders, have met with the Minister of Finance, have met with the Minister of Agriculture, Fort Erie Racing, the Mayor, SEIU and the community have done all the right things. Premier, you need to protect the Fort Erie Racetrack, and we need to be a permanent member of the Racing Alliance. Question. Will you act on your commitment and ensure that the Fort Erie Racetrack remains open and the thousands of jobs are protected? Thank you. Thank you. You see it, please. You see it, please. Thank you, Minister. Uh, the Minister of Agriculture and Food, Mr. Speaker. Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. I want to thank the, the member for Niagara Falls for a supplementary. We did take action. When we became aware that Woodbine had changed its stabling policy, we convened a, a meeting. The member from Niagara Falls was part of it. The member from St. Catharines was part of it. The Minister of Finance was part of it. I was part of it, Ontario Racing was part of it, the Ontario Lottery Corporation. We did make a change to assist the Fort Erie. We do know that this government is committed to 15 tracks, the stability long term, here in the province of Ontario, two thoroughbred tracks, a quarter horse tracks, and 12 standard bed tracks. And we, we put, brought into a change. We understand that the change uh, uh, needs to be looked at again, and it's going to be our opportunity when the season finishes at Fort Erie on October the 17th. We're asking Ontario Racing yes, to take a look at this to make sure a new policy is put in place for 2018. Yes, new question, member from Davenport. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Transportation. Speaker, when I'm talking to members of my community of Davenport, matters regarding transit and transportation always end up being some of the most pressing topics of conversation, and such was true this past weekend. And whether that conversation is about creating more bike-friendly communities or improved access to the GO network, residents in Davenport expect government to listen and to make critical investments that will improve their daily lives. However, I'm aware that last week the member from Kitchener-Conestoga, also the Conservative transportation critic, spoke to some members of my community about the party opposite's plan, or lack thereof. Speaker, would the minister please provide more information on our government's plan to build transit while also listening to the needs of local communities and, more importantly, my community of Davenport? Thank you. Minister of Transportation. Uh, thanks very much, Speaker. Good of course, question. I want to begin by thanking 
thanking the MPP from Davenport for her question, also for her unparalleled advocacy for her community right. and specifically for her advocacy yeah. around this particular issue. Speaker, this August we issued a request for qualifications for a grade separation at the Davenport Diamond, which will allow us to deliver enhanced go service to more communities around the region. And because of the member from Davenport's advocacy on behalf of her community, this project also includes enhancements to the public realm, including artwork and new pedestrian and cyclist routes. Speaker, let me be clear. Metrolinx has committed to fully funding the public oh, realm enhancements that were depicted in the initial design for both the overpass and the park, Speaker. And I want to say explicitly here in this legislature, that's happening because the MPP from Davenport fought long and hard and successfully to make sure that we got it right, Speaker. We also know that noise is another key concern for yes, the sir. community. That's why, prior to electrification of the Barrie Corridor, Metrolinx is also committed to capping the number of trains at 36 per day, Speaker. And post-electrification, we are looking at additional measures to further reduce disruption in the community. Thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the minister for his answer. I know that members of my community are paying close attention, very close attention, how this project moves forward and how we plan to continue to engage with the community. I'm very proud of the work of the countless advocates in Davenport, including those who are part of the Community Advisory Committee and those who have attended consultations over the last number of years. Community consultations and feedback have made and continue to make this project stronger. They made these public realms enhance enhancements possible, and these enhancements are in addition to the proposed new Bloor Davenport GO station. Speaker, last week when the member from Kitchener Conestoga was in my riding, he spoke about a number of projects beyond the Davenport Diamond, yet he didn't commit moving forward on anything. Unlike the party opposite, I know our government is making progress. Would the Question. minister please update on what else our government is doing to improve connections and making commuting more convenient? for residents in Davenport. Thank you, Minister. Uh, speaker, thanks very much, and I thank the member for her follow-up question. There is a lot of exciting progress that's taking place around transit and transportation in Davenport. For example, Speaker, we are moving forward with the Eglinton Crosstown LRT, a $5.3 billion investment that is being made by our government. And Speaker, on that project this summer, we officially installed the first piece of track on the line, bringing us one step closer to its completion by 2021. Also this summer, Speaker, we announced the completion of the widening of the Dufferin Street Bridge. As part of this project, we are partnering with Toronto to ex extend the West Toronto Rail Path multi-use trail for pedestrians and cyclists. And most recently, Speaker, Metrolinx announced that we are moving forward on a critical pedestrian link to connect the Bloor, Union Pearson and GO station with the Dundas West subway station, which is critically important for commuters in the West End of Toronto. Yes, Speaker, Our government is absolutely committed to making the necessary investments in communities across the province, including, of course, in Davenport. And again, Speaker, I want to thank the member from Davenport for her exceptional work. Your thank question, you. The member from uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the uh, Minister of Health. Uh, Minister, as you know, on June 1st, my private member's resolution was debated and received support from all three parties in this legislature. The resolution asked the government to immediately approve the planning grants requested by both the Collingwood General Marine Hospital and Stevens Memorial Hospital in Alliston, thereby allowing both hospitals to proceed with stage two of much needed redevelopments. Well, Minister, that was almost four months ago, and we've heard nothing since. The only thing the hospitals need is your approval and that of your government. Minister, will your government support my resolution? Will you follow through with this commitment and approve planning grants for these projects? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I do appreciate the question from the member opposite. Uh, and the member, of course, knows that uh, for some time uh, my ministry, the Lynn, the local hospital, and the community have been working together uh, on uh, their. Uh, uh, planned investments, uh, the efforts that they're making to improve the quality of health services even further in Collingwood and the surrounding area. Uh, but the member also knows that there is a, pro there, there is a very deliberate and specific process that, that uh, um, we work with, whether it's a hospital in Collingwood or anywhere in this province, uh, when we look at new investments. And, uh, and we do that uh, very enthusiastically and very closely with local communities to ensure that we get it right. It's part of an investment, an unprecedented investment 
investment in hospital infrastructure, which now over the next 10 years amounts to $20 billion that we're investing specifically Answer. in new hospital and hospital expansions and improvements. Uh, but this is a project that obviously we've been looking at together and we'll continue to make sure that we're making the right steps Thank you. forward. Supplementary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Back to the uh, Minister. Minister, you know that both hospitals, Alliston and Collingwood, are spending uh, patients' uh, frontline money. Uh, both have spent over $1.2 million of their operating budgets uh, to do the planning so far. Uh, we've been encouraged by the Lynn in both cases. We've been encouraged by your ministry and by yourself, and we appreciate that. But we're in a catch-22 now. If you don't want to approve these projects, just tell us, and we'll stop planning for a while. But we'd like the opportunity to move forward, pay the hospitals back for the patient money they've spent, allow them to move forward. You don't have to approve the hundreds of millions that these things will eventually cost over 25 or 30 years. Just let them move to the next couple of stages. Uh, we'll have an election by the time they get to the next stage. Uh, they'll have paid back their money. You'll have done your part, and we'll see where we go from there. But they need the opportunity to prove Question. to you and the Premier and your colleagues in the, in the government. Uh, that, that they deserve to have these hospitals. All the other hospitals in Simcoe County, Gray and Dufferin have been done in our Thank time. You. These two have had nothing done with it. Well, um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and uh, we have, I think it's now 35 uh, infrastructure projects involving hospitals that are either underway in the construction phase or in various phases of planning, Mr. Speaker, uh, that is part of that capital investment that I, uh, that I referenced earlier. 35 or even more uh, hospital infrastructure projects. And we announced, of course, in the recent budget further uh, expansions and new builds like Trillium Hospital in Mississauga, in Windsor, and Niagara, Mr. Speaker, that these are critically important investments, but they're no and they're no more important Mr. Speaker, than the hospitals such as the ones in Alliston and Collingwood. But we are following that process, and I have a very capable, hard-working uh, division within my ministry that does solely that, working with the Lynn, working with the local community. But I want to end, Mr. Speaker, on saying that I deeply appreciate the member opposite's advocacy for his community, for these two hospitals, and I hope we'll continue to work together to advance those two projects. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My uh, question is for the Premier. Last summer, a senior in Ottawa was assaulted in his long-term care home. Just last week, city officials responsible for long-term care in Ottawa went before the city council to talk about what they need to make homes in the region safer. The overwhelming opinion from city staff and councillors was that long-term care staff are doing the best they can with what they're given, but they're not given enough. When will the Premier start taking the crisis in long-term care seriously and expand the wet law for inquiry to look at systemic issues like funding levels? Thank you, Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, we, I and this government and the Premier, we take very, very seriously uh, the safety and security and well-being of uh, anyone, uh, predominantly but not exclusively anyone residing in our long-term care homes across this province. And Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm proud to say that as a result of the inspection regime that this government brought in in 2014, we're seeing the effect of those annual inspections. 100 percent of long-term care homes are inspected, and what we've seen uh, it, since uh, um, 2004, the average number of compliance orders issued during an annual inspection have actually gone down by more than 50 percent. So as a result of this increased scrutiny, we're seeing the impact in our homes, and I want to re reassure, uh, and it's not a perfect system. There are many examples where we need to improve, improve and I agree with the member opposite on that, but we have to be cognizant that improvements are Thank taking you. place. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, the overwhelming opinion of both Ottawa councillors and city staff was that long-term care homes are underfunded by the province and have serious problems because of Chief that Governor fact. In Whip, fact, homes time. across this province have the same serious problems. Homes in Hamilton, homes in London, in Kingston, in Sudbury, in Thunder Bay, in Windsor, and all across this province, Speaker. Why won't this government listen 
to councillors, staff in Ottawa, and all of those loved ones who come here to plea with the government to do the right thing. Recognize that there is actually a crisis in long-term care in this province and expand the wet law for inquiry to include all of the systemic issues that are causing this crisis to occur. Well, Mr. Speaker, we are increasing our funding to long-term care homes. We've more than doubled that funding allocation since coming into office in 2003. And, Mr. Speaker, even as recently as this year's budget that that party and that leader of the third party voted against, we increased our funding to long-term care homes by more than $80 million. That increased, it included Mr. Speaker, $60 million going directly into resident care needs, specialized supports for convalescent care and physiotherapy for a wide range of health needs, Mr. Speaker, $10 million going into behavioral supports, so we have more than $50 million annually now going to those most complex patients, including individuals with dementia, Mr. Speaker, and we increased the food raw food envelope for long-term care by 6.5 percent, Mr. Speaker, even more than we were asked to by the sector. So an $80 million investment this yes, year sir. alone that that party adamantly and specifically voted against. Thank you. New question. The member from Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Infrastructure. Every member of this House knows that our province is leading in unprecedented investments in infrastructure. But sadly, that did not stop the Leader of the Opposition and the member from Dufferin Caledon from suggesting that we're underinvesting and we aren't getting shovels in the ground. The fact is that suggestion couldn't be further from the truth. We are building and repairing schools, hospitals and public transit because we're committed to making everyday life easier for the people of Ontario. In my riding of Kitchener Centre, the province has invested in a new LRT system four new schools, an expansion to a local hospital. All you have to do is a quick check to Ontario.ca slash build on, and it will show you that shovels are in the ground in every riding of this province. Speaker, could Question. the minister please speak to how these historic investments stack up against the opposition's dismal track record? Thank you. Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you, Speaker, and thanks to the member for the question. Uh, last week, the member for Dufferin Caledon was questioning our government's commitment to infrastructure, Speaker. But, Speaker, neither the NDP nor the PCs took infrastructure seriously when they were in office. In 2001 2002, the PT spent only $1.9 billion for Ontario's infrastructure needs. While our government has been averaging over $11 billion per year, and our plan is building better lives for people in Ontario by delivering $300 million annually to smaller communities, including over $53 million to PC riding, Speaker. We are investing over $20 billion in transit. We're contributing $270 million to nearly 1,400 water and wastewater projects. We committed $100 million to natural gas and $200 million to broadband expansion. Speaker, the opposition needs to do a fact check. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and my thanks to the Minister for his answer. It's important for every member of this House and every constituent that we represent to have the facts as we move forward with our $190 billion plan to build better lives in Ontario. That's because infrastructure is about much more than just buildings and construction. It's about growing the economy and enhancing quality of life, and the evidence tells a very compelling story about our investments and how they're paying off. Just yesterday, the construction industry representatives that I met with from my region told me that this past year has been the best year ever for them in their 30 years of being in business, and they thanked me. Ontario's unemployment rate is the lowest it's been in 16 years, and we've added over 750,000 new jobs since the height of the recent recession. Speaker, Question. could the minister please address concerns about so-called underspending and sharing the facts? Thank you, Minister. Thank you again for the question, Speaker. A number of projects were awaiting approval by federal authorities, but, Mr. Speaker, any suggestion that we are underinvesting in infrastructure is simply not accurate. Here are some facts for the members. Fact: We are making the largest infrastructure investment in Ontario's history, an unprecedented $190 billion over three years. 
fact, communities in Dufferin Caledon are receiving nearly $8 million in funding through the Ontario Community Infrastructure Fund and $2.7 million Member through the Dufferin Clean Water Caledon. and Wastewater Fund, over $10 million. Fact, the Leader of the Opposition rose in this House last week to criticize us for underfunding. But he failed to mention that he and his entire caucus voted against our budget, which included an additional $30 billion for critical, critical infrastructure. Speaker, it is absurd that the opposition is criticizing us for supposedly not spending Thank enough you. when they voted against spending Thank you. New question, member from Elgin, Middlesex, London. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Mr. Speaker, after hearing from small business owners from around the province, it's clear that the Liberals' tax, hike, tax hikes will hurt them and our economy overall. Despite hearing from Premier Brian Pallister, Premier Stephen McNeil, and BC's Minister of Finance Carol James all expressing their concerns that these changes will hurt their communities, Ontarians have yet to hear a word from our Premier or this government. They're all higher in the polls. As the Premier too. knows, Mr. Speaker, over a decade ago, the government of Ontario allowed doctors to incorporate in lieu of fee increases. Today, 70 per cent of doctors in Ontario have done just that and incorporated and operate small businesses in our province. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier stand with her provincial counterparts in Manitoba, Nova Scotia and British Columbia? Will she help stop Stop these liberal tax hikes and stand here, here, up for here. small business Just say no. Just say no. Minister responsible for small business. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the, the member for a question. Uh, all Ontarians can rest assured uh, that the Premier of Ontario stands for the Premier of Ontario. And we do know that she's been engaged with the federal finance minister, the private, the prime minister, and others with regards to those tax changes. But, Mr. Speaker, I think the members should be writing some questions for the Leader of the Opposition in Ottawa, Mr. Scheer. Now, is, is his talent so bad in Ottawa that he can't get anybody to write questions? So I suggest to the member, send the question to Ottawa and allow him to answer it. Thank you. There being no deferred votes, this House stands recess until 3 p.m. this afternoon.